On behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation and our member companies, welcome to this edition of Autos 2050's Future Driven Forum, our ongoing digital discussion series. Today's session is Auto Manufacturing 101. What does it take to design and manufacture new vehicles? Please welcome our host, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, President and CEO, John Bazella. Good morning and thanks for joining us. The car you see in a dealer showroom today began as an idea, perhaps five years ago. Three years ago, designers and engineers produced a prototype of that vehicle and began testing it. The company was already deciding where and how the car would be built and who would build it. For the next year or two, the car might be sent to the Arizona desert or the Arctic Circle, and its components and systems pushed to the breaking point, all to be sure that the car performed whenever and wherever it might be needed. 18 months ago, the car's design and manufacturing parameters were locked. Six months ago, job one rolled off the assembly line. All told, it took five years and anywhere from two to five billion dollars and thousands of people to bring that car to market. The automobile is a unique consumer product. It's the most expensive and perhaps emotional recurring purchase most of us make. And the mobility it provides supports our social, economic, and family well being, as well as that of the communities across the United States where the vehicles and components are built and the research, development, design, and testing are done. The process of bringing a car to market requires the creation and integration of literally thousands of parts, which come together through precision manufacturing hundreds of thousands of times per year at a single assembly plant. That makes it the most complex product sold to the public at large. And virtually every aspect of the vehicle's development and manufacturer is regulated. The auto industry has years of experience building vehicles that meet well-established benchmarks for safety, emissions, comfort, utility, performance, and cost. Ongoing vehicle electrification and automation won't change those fundamental objectives, but they can alter how we achieve them. Today, we'll talk about the process of bringing a vehicle to market how advanced technology and software might change that process, and how supply chains may change as a result. We'll look at the realities of auto production, lead times, capital requirements, and sustainability, and also explore how industry and policymakers can work together to accelerate cleaner, safer, and smarter personal mobility. Before we do that, however, we've asked our chairing company, Toyota, to share with us a bit more about a car's journey from design board to driveway. For well over a century, the automotive industry has remained one of the most powerful engines driving the U.S. economy. Roughly 10 million jobs and billions of dollars in investments are generated by the complex and interwoven business that defines modern automotive manufacturing. No other industry in America has such an expansive reach to every state, delivering economic benefits across so many sectors. In 1893, brothers Charles and Frank Duryea debuted the first U.S.-built gasoline-powered car. And while countless advances have been made in the intervening years, the time frame from conceptualization to the start of mass production is still a much lengthier and more complex process than many realize. That process, regardless of make or model, can take up to 72 months and begins in the same way, with an idea. That idea, often born from a mix of customer need, corporate direction, and artistic vision, starts with a simple sketch. As a design team completes the sketch, the concept is refined to include considerations for the propulsion system, passenger comfort, and functionality. Soon, what was once only an idea has evolved into a clay model, and as that model takes shape, designers begin choosing the specific materials and colors that not only speak to the intended design elements, but are also functional and meet or exceed industry standards. Once the final design and styling are approved, 
Teams of development engineers, production engineers, and purchasing specialists collaborate to craft the design into a safe, attractive vehicle that can be sold at a price that is both appealing to the customer and profitable for the manufacturer. As development engineers prepare to build physical prototypes, they use innovations such as virtual and augmented reality and advanced computer simulations to understand how the vehicle and the parts it's comprised of will perform in the real world. While the prototype plans are being developed, purchasing teams begin working with suppliers, both locally and globally, to source the thousands of components needed to build not only the test vehicles, but also for the hundreds of thousands of real-world vehicles that will eventually be rolling off the assembly line. With prototypes being planned and parts ordered, the production engineering team evaluates the design from a manufacturing perspective. They assess needed tooling, physical changes to the assembly plant, and how the new design will impact existing logistics and assembly processes, all the way down to the ergonomic impact that building the vehicle will have on each line worker. During the development process, hundreds of prototype vehicles are hand-built to confirm part fitment, design elements, and assembly processes. During both the vehicle and assembly process development, augmented and virtual reality systems help confirm things like component orientation and process and tooling changes. These innovations, combined with rapid prototyping and additive manufacturing, allow last-minute design changes to be iterated and confirmed. Once completed, prototype vehicles are used by evaluation teams to ensure they will not only meet design and customer expectations, but that they also meet or exceed regulatory requirements for areas such as passenger and pedestrian safety, fuel economy, and emission standards. Following prototype testing, the development and production engineering teams work together with the manufacturing plant to begin test builds on the assembly line. Soon after, manufacturing will be ramped up to mass production one of the final steps in the chain before the vehicle can finally go on sale. While the auto industry has come a long way in the nearly 130 years since that first Duryea motor wagon took to the streets, innovations in the areas of 3D printed metals, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and battery science provide promise that the industry's next 100 years will be filled with advances, challenges, and changes that America's automotive pioneers could never have imagined. To build on our understanding of this process, I'm really pleased to be joined by two seasoned senior automotive executives. Tom Stricker is Group Vice President of Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs, Toyota Motor North America. He is responsible for Toyota's US-based environmental sustainability strategy and projects, mm -hmm. motor vehicle safety and environmental regulations, operations environmental regulations, and enterprise chemical management. Also with us is Paul Thomas, Executive Vice President, Mobility Solutions for the Americas at Bosch. Paul has more than 25 years of experience in product development, production control, logistics, and manufacturing. In his current role, he's responsible for sales, marketing, and quality operations in the Americas region, as well as the regional lead for sales excellence in North America. Tom, Paul, thanks for joining us today. Okay, let's, let's build on what we saw in, in the video, which I think did a really nice job of walking us comprehensively through the process from start to finish. And Tom, I wanna to start with you. Um, let's focus on what you think the key elements of this process are and perhaps what some of the challenges are as we think of bringing a vehicle to market. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, by the way, it's great to be here today with uh, you and Paul. Uh, appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, I agree. The video covered the basics of the manufacturing process. Uh, what's interesting is the video really covered what happens with one model but we have dozens of models and of course, hundreds of them across the industry. Uh, so what I would emphasize really is the complexity of not just building a vehicle, but building a fleet of vehicles and supplying a fleet of vehicles. It's, it's like the difference between learning to master an instrument and then learning to conduct the orchestra, right? We kind of saw the instrument in the video, but we have, a, we have an orchestra that we're conducting. And with a five to six year lead time, we also are doing a lot of crystal balling. Um, we need to look forward 
and decide what's the customer going to want five or six years from now? What are going to be the regulatory requirements that we have to meet? And those aren't always clear, as you know. Uh, will there be the infrastructure to support, for example, new powertrain technologies? Will people even still buy cars? Will they lease them more? Will mobility providers purchase the vehicles? So there's a, a lot of things that we have to project out. So when the customer sees that vehicle coming onto the dealership, it was a vehicle that we envisioned, you know, four or five years ago. Mm. You know, Paul, let's let's bring your perspective in. Bosch is a major player in the process, providing significant technologies and components um, to uh, to the vehicle. And so what's your sense, uh, key elements of the process and some challenges that we that we need to understand? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. And, and Tom, way to wait, good way to set that question up too, from the from the standpoint of an auto of an auto producer. Um, what we're looking at was the as the industry is transforming, right? We have to look ahead into the market and say, what does the consumer really want? And when we do that, uh, what's also important to note is that there's a lot of software and services and products that go into the vehicle that allow it to be personalized, automated, connected, and of course electrified. Um, this will promote this smooth mobility um, in the future. But before you can do all of those great things, the first thing you have to do is make sure you have a very credible product by using a lot of internal controls. So we do a lot of work, which is like adding software with cybersecurity, with the right level of protections in the software to protect it for future proof uh, in situations that may happen five or six years down the road. We also have to validate our products uh, continuously to ensure that there's quality input uh, to the product and that the performance meets uh, the high demands of the market. If you look at driver's assistance, um, it's very difficult to just put that in a vehicle without doing many, many hours, weeks, years of simulation to make sure that you consider all of the aspects that are going into that vehicle. Um, we also do prototyping. We use test tracks and we use artificial intelligence as we make sure that we capture all these uh, requirements of future products. So it's not as simple as saying you want a product, put it in the vehicle or put it into the market um, and make sure that it works. Yeah, really interesting. You know, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this, this idea of scale and complexity. I mean, you know, Tom, I love the metaphor of the orchestra, you know, beyond beyond the instrument, right? So so to tell us a little bit more about that, right? I mean, you know, in a good year, we're selling 17 million uh, cars and light trucks in the, in, in the U.S. market. You've got you know, over you know, 13, 14 companies building vehicles in the United States and, you know, dozens of companies providing key, you know, supply uh, components and technologies. Um, give us a little bit more of a sense of that scale. Well, it's massive, uh, clearly. I mean, 17 million units, um, fingers crossed, you know, that's, that's a huge amount of vehicles. And, you know, it's one thing to hand build a prototype vehicle, test it, have it work fine, have it pass all the required regulations, you know, meet all the customer needs. It's a completely different challenge and task to build that same vehicle using thousands of people, tens of thousands of parts from hundreds of suppliers over and over and over again, every day for multiple years. And it's, you know, any misstep in that that orchestra, any bad note somewhere along that way, uh, you know, could be something as benign as a warranty claim, uh, or it could be something of much more concern around a safety issue. So we have a huge responsibility to get it right. Um, and it's not just we Toyota or we the OEMs, it's we the ecosystem working together with the suppliers, uh, you know, and so forth to to make sure that this re this process can be repeated and repeated. And I can't underemphasize the importance of process and training. Of course, Toyota is known for the Toyota production system, but there's a reason for it because we we have to do this over and over and over again, the same way, the same fit and finish, the same quality. And uh, so, so training of the team members and, and adherence to process is a key part of what we do. 
Yeah, Paul, um, you know, Tom mentioned the, you know, the 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 work with many, many suppliers. I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. Are you just getting a specification from the, the manufacturer or is it a more iterative process? Um, you know, you're developing technologies as well as building components. What is that relationship like between a major company like Bosch and a major producer like Toyota? What, what how does what, what goes into that relationship? Yeah, let me um, let me let me go back one set one uh, one moment and talk about scalability first, and I'll show you how that relates to a relationship with a, a large OEM. But scalability, um, you you can't just scale from a Monday to a Friday, right? Before you can scale, you have to plan um, your investments. You have to look um, ahead, uh, as Tom had mentioned. If you had a crystal ball, it would be great. But you have to predict the trends in the market. Um, and you have to do that um, long before you know the consumer wants that type of product in the market. So, for instance, if you look at electrification, um, you can't just do electrification from a Monday to a Friday, like I said, but we've we've invested around six hundred million dollars per year over the past 10 years to prepare for electrification. And this year we're going to spend, excuse me, more than eight hundred million dollars developing e-mobility solutions, which is an increase from where we were last year of about 40 percent. So I think that if you look at electrification or fuel cell and, and all of these new investments, um, the way that you can scale those and partner with an OEM <clears throat> is make sure you have the technologies available when they need them. So if I receive a phone call from Tom in Toyota, for instance, and he says, I'm looking for this new technology, I should already have it available and not have to say, give me five years to develop it. Right. So you've got to be working between the uh, OEM, so receiving messages from the OEMs and the market. And then, of course, taking a chance as a big tier one to make sure you put the money in the right basket so to speak, to deliver the product required um, as necessary. And I guess that uh, the only other comment I'd like to make is you can't do this without valuable partners. In the past, maybe you had one stakeholder that could carry from the start to the finish a product or technology, but that's no longer the case because the mobility market has become so complicated and so different that we have to know when you when, what your strengths are and when you need to partner to drive uh, better solutions. At Bosch, we've always said if you want it in microns of specificity and millions of produced volume, we could always do that, right? But now we're saying not only can we be a high volume producer and high quality like Toyota, we want to also be your partner in services and software, things not only manufacturing related. So scalability has to start, as you asked for, a long time before the market actually needs it. And then you have to develop partnerships uh, with the OEM level and the consumer to deliver it. Uh, on time. Yeah, that's real. I want to come back to uh, mm. services and software in a second, but ju just to finish up the, the sort of level setting on the process, you know, um, Tom, help us understand, you know, how long does it, once once we've gotten this vehicle to the dealership, how long uh, does it last in the marketplace? Well, John, it, it varies, uh, of course, but typically anywhere from four to eight years or more, when you when you get a platform and a vehicle into the dealer lots that you'll see you know that that vehicle um, not exactly the same i mean obviously we do minor changes and and uh, refreshes on uh, aesthetics we can also do certain powertrain upgrades uh, or options and things like that clearly you can get electronics into a model um, maybe at a different pace than for example a powertrain into a model um, but it's like I said, it's typically four to eight years or so. And trucks tend to have generally longer product cycles. But Paul touched on this, I think, earlier. We're also using a lot of different processes to to speed that and, and get get more uh, new models out to the public quicker uh, using fast prototyping and augmented reality, artificial intelligence, but also. Uh, and I know this does harken back to what Paul just mentioned in terms of the, the partnership, uh, is working earlier in the process than we ever have with the suppliers. Uh, we established a, a Toyota supplier center at our R&D campus up in Michigan, and the suppliers come right on site very early into the process to help validate the design, the manufacturability, of what it is that they're providing to us, um, you know, we need we need the suppliers to 
to prosper because we can't risk a break in the supply chain. So we need them to be successful just like we want to be successful. No, fascinating. I, you know, I want to I want to come back to uh, the uh, come some of the ideas Paul mentioned a, a minute ago, and let me let me get get back there by by asking the question this way: What are some of the things that you know the typical consumer may not be aware of uh, when they think about vehicle manufacturing and production? It might be elements that go into the vehicle, for example, software and services. But you know, let let's let's get beyond you know the the sort of uh, typical understanding and talk a little bit more about what the customer may not know about the process. So, Paul, let me start with you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what's changing a lot of the mobility market is most consumers don't understand that the vehicle is becoming much more of a, a domain machine where everything needs to talk to each other. And in order to do that, you have to have a very robust software package in the vehicle. And I don't think that consumers, uh, not, not saying that they don't understand it, but the complexity of software um, in the vehicle is very different than it was 20 years ago. And you have to look at it from an advanced standpoint um, as an enabler for a lot of the trends. So you can't have your car um, with high levels of driver's assistance and you can't have a vehicle with safety functions just by adding components. They have to be able to talk to each other. And the only way they can do that is with very, very robust software. Yeah, because, you know, in the consumer electronic world, if your phone um, all of a sudden doesn't work, uh, you can reset it. But when you're driving down the road at 50 miles an hour, you can't reset your vehicle. So the software becomes extremely important um, at that from that standpoint. So what we've done, or at least our, we've recognized that you have to have a, a look at the way vehicles, the cross domain computing systems, the way the braking system talks to the steering system, the way the steering system talks to the safety systems. And we made a, a large organizational change in the beginning of 2021 and where we released a cross domain computing organization. And in this organization, we bring together the hardware expertise that we've always had along with our software expertise. And we bring that together um, in, a, in, a, in a way that we can fuse it to deliver very good products, of course, to our OEM customers, but also making sure that we take advantage of all the information going through the vehicle to give the consumer the best experience um, they can have. And here it's about finding this beautiful balance between vehicle architecture, which is rapidly moving towards a highly networked vehicle that's communicating internally and externally, um, and then using artificial intelligence along those lines to teach the vehicle how to sense, act, and move along those ways. So fundamentally, we want to connect the vehicle more to its surroundings, interpret the information, and then deliver safety um, the best way as possible. So yeah, really, that that's a there's a lot in that. Tom, um, can you want to build on that? I mean, because I, I I think I think software and data um, really raise some interesting opportunities and some challenges as well. Correct. Well, they do. They, they, you know, Paul covered the waterfront pretty well there in terms of, uh, you know, the, the landscape and, and the changes that we're seeing with technology. But bringing in all the, the different software solutions, it does present new challenges and uh, and opportunities. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of consumer benefit that we see. There's a lot of safety benefit. There's new business models. There's potential new revenue streams from having all of this uh, connectivity uh, that our customers can utilize. Um, at the at the same time, uh, you know there are cyber risks. For example, when you start uh, getting into this level of of, uh, of computing, and the industry is working closely uh, together through an organization called the Auto ISAC, which is an information sharing and analysis center where we can share threat information uh, in a in a secure environment with each other and with suppliers to uh, to catch potential problems early on and hopefully make sure they don't turn into to bigger problems later. Uh, so, but let me just say this, um, building on what Paul said, the one thing I would say to consumers, and, and I and I did it when we were on airplanes, um, and maybe when we get back to more airplanes, I'll be doing it again, is I tell people, this is a fantastic industry to work in right now. Um, it's more than just about the four wheels. Uh, it's about all the things Paul talked about and that and that we've touched on here. Um, you know, dozens of processors, millions of lines of code, 
uh, AI, robotics. Uh, it's it's just a, a really interesting and fascinating industry to be involved with, and it's only going to get better. So I would tell people brush your resumes up and uh, come join us on this on this journey. And and while we're on that topic, I mean, you, you know. This is true not only of the product development process, but of the manufacturing process itself, right? I mean, both of these processes are high tech, um, you know, uh, employment opportunities. Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the transformation is requiring, um, you know, a lot of people to uh, change the way they work. Of course, we're all dealing with uh, differences in the way um, our organizations are managing workflow and associates, but we're also seeing the need for a lot more software engineers, right? As you move from a purely hardware, I don't want to say purely hardware, but a primarily hardware organization to an organization that has to develop software and services, we're doing a lot of upskilling uh, of our people. So we're trying to give people paths to more, let's say, software related jobs. We have large apprentice programs that we work on with, of course, all the universities around also to bring the right people in. And and Tom, I couldn't agree more um, in many travels. It's good to see that the automotive industry, people are targeting to work in it more than they did in the past because the vehicles are becoming much smarter and much more interesting to work on, especially as you move towards electrification and automation. And you know the personalization is becoming more important and user experience, all these engineers that do work on user experience are also looking at the automotive industry um, to become a little more robust platform for development. So yeah, I would agree, John, 100%. Yeah, I want to come back to that, the transformation, electrification and automation in a second. But I, I, I want to come back to something Tom mentioned about cybersecurity and, and Paul, get your take on it. I mean, Tom talked about the importance of, of information sharing and analysis. In other words, what are the threats and vulnerabilities? Um, how do we think about cybersecurity further upstream in the process? It, you know, is it something that you work to design in or is it something that you work to resolve later? Yeah, I mean, uh, Bosch has been a, a very large participant in the Auto Isaac uh, organization that Tom talked about. We, we've we chaired that organization uh, over a period of time with uh, some people in my organization. But clearly, cybersecurity, you, you have to start at the beginning because even in the manufacturing process, you need to make sure you have robust um, security protocols in place because you're you're delivering ECUs or body computers to a vehicle that can be compromised even before it makes it to the consumer. Hmm. So starting from the beginning, you have to understand how are these devices going to be manufactured? Do we have the right access to the devices? How is the software going to be controlled and ported onto the device? And then once it's on there, how do you make sure that when it gets to the customer, they can unlock the correct software in the best way. So cybersecurity, again, uh, I've said it uh, earlier today, um, it's you can't just wake up tomorrow and say, we want to do it. You have to have a very good plan from start to finish. And then once it gets into the market, you have to monitor, um, as Tom had mentioned, and make sure that the consumer is safe and that uh, the software is robust enough and can't be compromised. So, so cybersecurity sounds to me it, 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 not not uh, not that there is one software solution or one hardware solution. It almost sounds to me like a process um, that you've got to constantly attend to and improve and develop over time. Is that, is that a good high level summary? Well, I would say that um, software is always changing, right? So if you 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 never develop a piece of software and not get upgrades. So with that standpoint says, yes, you always have to be vigilant about it. It's nothing you can just put in the market and forget about and say, we did our job. You have to be cognizant of the fact that the world changes, devices change and get new upgrades. And also the people that want to do bad things uh, to software, they're also getting smarter and have different tools. So you have to be able to um, you know, act towards their, uh, <laughs> towards their vigilance as well. Yeah, and John, that that was something. I'm sorry, John. That was something I wanted to also reinforce is that the bad actors move quickly, and they they can certainly move quickly, more quickly, for example, than than we can put regulations in place, you know, to try to guide uh, designs and so forth. So that's why the industry collaboration and with the supply chain, and and putting forward best practices, for example, that can be. Uh, put together much quicker among the experts in the field 
and then the you know the industry can can uh, utilize those best practices much more quickly than a longer term you know three four year kind of regulatory process because by then you've already probably changed the software two or three times out in the field yeah that we could we could talk all day about cybersecurity and I, I think it really is important but I I, 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 I feel like this is um, a very helpful perspective. I want to I want to shift now um, back to the transformation that you both referenced earlier um, moving toward uh, more electrification um, you know uh, plug-in hybrids, battery electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and then also, uh, advanced safety systems and ultimately uh, uh, highly automated driving systems. What does that transformation mean um, for the manufacturing process and for the product development process? How do you, how do you, how will the process change as a result of that transformation? And and Paul, let me start with you here. Yeah, I think that um, I'll I'll take a, a pretty good example, right? Everyone everyone's familiar with an internal combustion engine, right? We we probably have driven one of those in our life, right? And we're hearing that, of course, the shift to electric vehicles are coming. Um, I think that when you when you talk about that manufacturing dilemma, right? You have one which uh, one which is very capital intensive and uh, has taken many years to build the infrastructure for internal combustion engine, and then the new uh, EV side of the business, which is a little bit different. Um, you've got to balance your, um, as an organization of our size, um, the the transition from ICE to electric vehicles. And you have to do that responsibly, both from a manufacturing standpoint, a cost standpoint, a people standpoint, and of course, what society is looking for um, along that standpoint to, to maintain carbon neutrality. So I think that, um, you know, we've done that well. Um, we have many locations in North America, Charleston uh, being one of them. And where we're making sure that facility has a good balance of both internal combustion type products and electrification products so that as the industry changes whether it's uh, stays ICE I mean again my crystal ball can't tell me what the consumers want we're in a very good position to maintain our ICE business and if it moves to electrification we also have the ability to flex our resources so I think from a manufacturing standpoint you have to be prepared now uh, for both of these options, you have to stay competitive, both quality, cost, and delivery, whether you're providing an, an e-machine or battery pack or a cell, or whether you're delivering injectors and a fuel rail. So um, I think it's important you have to keep both in play. Mm, Tom, your, your perspective on this. Yeah, great, great points, Paul. And building on the electrification example, maybe... In terms of specific impacts on manufacturing and, and kind of the, the downstream business from there, um, electron, electric powertrains and fuel cells and other things mean uh, new supply chains, right? Critical minerals for batteries and so forth. Uh, it means worker training because we have new assembly techniques and totally new processes that uh, we, are, we are bringing into the system. Uh, it probably means new plants in terms of battery uh, capacity and so forth, uh, or or different lines in existing plants, and it spills all the way down to the dealer. The dealer needs to service these vehicles. They need to be able to sell the vehicles. They need to understand the vehicles they're selling. So dealer personnel at the sales level need to be trained, and clearly the people who are servicing the vehicles need to be trained. And the dealers may need their own uh, small scale infrastructure in terms of vehicle charging or hydrogen refueling uh, when they're servicing these vehicles. Um, and so there's a, a lot of other downstream effects. And to, to Paul's point about just the, the overall sort of scale and uncertainty and the need to strike a balance between running in one direction and forgetting about the other direction, we, we do need to maintain that that balance and we need to proceed deliberately. Um, if you if you look back at even modest technologies like uh, fuel injection or the addition of catalytic converters or automatic transmissions, those transitions in the market took years to go from having you know zero fuel injection to having 100% fuel injection, for example. And some of that is because consumers are risk averse. 
manufacturers, frankly, are a little bit risk averse. You, you know, you'll see a technology come out in a model, but you'll see how it goes. You know, you don't want to just the first time you develop a new technology, you put it out there and 40% of your fleet, not that you could anyways, given the, the product cycles and the other constraints, but you wouldn't want to do that. You want to put the technology out there, see how it goes, get some data on it, and then gradually expand that, see how consumers embrace the technology and so forth. So, you know, you, you simply can't dive in and just swap everything around all at once, as Paul said, and, and companies don't have the resources to do that anyways. Yeah, so there's a big capital requirement here, right? I mean, you're talking about transforming supply chains. I mean, you know, that's an interesting phrase, but, um, you know, and, and, and maybe too casual a phrase, right? I mean, you know, there are new components um, that need to be available for battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, right, that don't necessarily exist in the U.S. supply chain today and raw materials uh, and rare earth minerals um, that don't necessarily exist in today's U.S. supply chain, right? So, so um, it's going to take time, is what I hear you saying. It's going to take capital. So, what do we need to do to continue on that path um, beyond, you know, again, as as Paul said, you know, sort of making sure that you're managing your investments appropriately to to handle multiple pathways. What else do we need to be thinking about? And and do we need other sectors of the economy and perhaps government to be playing a role in this transformation? Well, well first of all, let me let me um let me take a shot at that first, Tom, um, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, what I want to do is just highlight, first of all, you know, we're we're looking at, at electrification, and I'll get to your question in a moment, across all the segments. So from from an e-bike, um, which could be considered recreational or even last mile delivery all the way up to a class eight truck. So, you know, you have to look at that broad portfolio uh, of products to say that, do you need battery electric vehicles? Do you need hydrogen fuel cells? Do you need hybrid type um, arrangements? And then also as those vehicles add battery packs and add weight, you know, you, uh, and add range, you can add up to a thousand pounds of mass the difference between an ICE vehicle and a battery electric vehicle on a basic standpoint. Then when you start adding a thousand pounds of mass, you have to ask yourself, do I need a different braking system? Do I need a different steering system? Are there things that are uh, attributable to those changes that aren't just powertrain related, right? You have to go beyond the powertrain only and begin to look at the other characteristics of the vehicle that could be problematic. And so, you know, despite all these challenges, you have to continue to invest not only in the electrification side of the business, but the other products that you need to support this shift, right? And then you have to have both available. What do you have available for your ICE engines and what you have available for your electrification? It could be a little bit different, but in the end, you, you wanna keep investing uh, along those lines. So I just wanted to kind of go along that path and let you know mm -hmm. that um, we're continuing to invest in all the business that's auxiliary to just only the powertrain. So yeah, that's a great point. Tom? Yeah, John. So you had a couple questions packed in there, and I think uh, the answer to all of them is pretty much yes. So uh, in terms of th there are other things that have to come together. Um, we the, the, the grid needs to be clean in terms of carbon. Otherwise, a shift to electrification uh, doesn't necessarily accomplish all the goals that it, it would be intended to accomplish. And, and that's happening, of course. Uh, at, a, at a pretty decent clip, there's you know a, a growing uh, amount of renewables uh, that are coming in, but you know it's regional um, right now and it's not everywhere. So uh, we do have that uh, need for for the electric grid and, and hydrogen production, for example, uh, to be clean in order to get the ultimate benefits that we're looking for. Uh, also importantly, when it comes to vehicles with batteries, we need a recycling system. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of hybrids out there, uh, mostly with nickel batteries at this point. Um, and and so it's it's not as big of a, a concern, although when those vehicles start reaching end of life, there will be a large number of batteries you know, that we need to do something with. And of course, the same with the lithium batteries and the, the new, whatever the technology is going to be for uh, future electrification. But we need a way, because of the challenges of the supply chain of these rare earths, we, we need to really think about 
how we can recapture some of those minerals either through recycling or whether we can repurpose the batteries you know for other uses in terms of storage um, but right now i think that's a little bit of an achilles heel that isn't getting enough attention and for example if the if the minerals are coming from overseas and you collect a bunch of batteries here in the states mm -hmm. and you extract the materials what do you do with them if you don't have a, a way to to build the batteries uh, you have to then send them back overseas the costs become extremely prohibitive and um, so it, it it i do really think it's a, an achilles heel that we need to really focus and pay attention on and, and we're doing that within our organization and i know a lot of others are as well and government support will be critical john um, you know the the technologies cost more incentives for consumers to uh to purchase these vehicles is critical and the need for infrastructure is imperative if you know it's it's the the cart and the horse you need one to have the other and so uh government policies that can support the development of uh, electric charging as well as hydrogen infrastructure will be critical yeah so let let's let's we, we've talked about cleaner um vehicles uh and the work that you're doing and the the necessity for a broad approach to that transformation let's go back to advanced safety systems and highly automated vehicles uh similar trans transformation required with regard to product development manufacturing supply chain those types of things is it a should we look at it in similar ways are we further behind are we a little bit ahead with regard to those technologies what's your view um paul yeah i mean i, I think i think uh, uh supply chain sustainability and whatever you're talking about is extremely important right i mean the industry's challenge today of course with our semiconductor um issue which has opened our eyes to let's say a little bit of um, what do we need to do differently in the automotive industry when uh, demand outstrips supply, right? And, and no one could have predicted um, that would happen. Um, so I think as you move uh, into driver's assistance or even to some advanced safety um, situations, what, what's important there is not only the hardware and the software, but I mentioned it earlier, is, is the people, right? I, I think that, um, when you look at the lines of code that you need to write um, versus what you did 20 years ago and versus what you need now, there might be, you know, a, a billion lines of code that's required to, to for a vehicle, and it might be transmitting a terabyte of data every day up into the cloud. So, for me, I think supplying the parts is always one thing, but supplying the solution uh, with the right people and the right software and the right resources to me will be the next critical um, discussion point. Um, and therefore, you know, you've you've got to do a lot of um, work while you're running in this transformation, right? You have to develop people along the right path um, to go along those ways um, from the skilled worker standpoint all the way up to the software engineer. So I'd like to say that, yeah, the resource situation, I think, will be the same. And I think Tom explained a lot about, you know, uh, the different types of materials you have to accumulate from the world. And of course, we're following that. But if I had to draw a difference, um, um, between what you have to do with automation and let's say hardware, um, you really need people to make that one happen. Mm. Right? And you need computing power and you need um, the ability for everything to kind of talk together. So I hope I kind of, um, John, hope I answered your question there. I, I, I wanted to make sure I did that make, you know we focus on people as well as, as one of our critical resources. So. Yeah, that that is such an important point. Um, you know, it, it, the and 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 I I think what I heard you say and I want to just make sure I understood it right. I mean, when you're thinking about investments in people, you're talking about all the way across the process, right? Not only the software engineers that you mentioned earlier, but uh, the teams on the plant floors that are actually uh, designing and building those 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 components and and integrating um, those software solutions into hardware. Correct. Correct. I mean, this year alone, we're going to spend, I, I mean, I'm throwing some numbers, we're going to spend $250 million um, specifically for mobility in our region. And um, that's going into our Charleston location, um, where we're going to spend $80 million along those areas. And that's a manufacturing facility. So yeah, we're, we're trying to make sure that we build up um, the people, the infrastructure, of course, and the product development uh, to support the transformation. So clearly, it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. Yeah.
Yeah. You know, you mentioned the uh, the semiconductor shortage. You know, Tom, let, let, me, let me put you on the spot a little bit. Um, you know, I grew up in the automotive industry learning about, um, you know, just in time auto production where, mm-hmm. you know, the goal was to have zero inventory on the plant floor. Right. And what would happen is a component would show up in the manufacturing process at the point of fit at the moment it was needed. Does the does the semiconductor shortage suggest we might be thinking about that process differently going forward than we have in the past? Well, John, I think anytime you have a learning opportunity, you need to learn. And I I don't think I can answer that question probably as clearly and directly as the viewers will want to hear. But certainly, uh, you know, we're we're known, um, among others, of course, for the lean supply and, and, uh, you know, limited inventory and and things like that. And, um, you know, so that does pose challenges. What's interesting is some of the some of the challenges that we've seen are are long, right? They're not short duration challenges. And so you also have to ask yourself, okay, maybe it would have helped to have, you know, some microchips processor stored away somewhere but how many would you really have to store to account for the disruption and the 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 length of what we are experiencing right now so you know there's sort of two sides to that coin uh in terms of the time and and the same for example uh, there's been a lot of other issues just you know with with the uh weather in texas over the winter and the lack of natural gas and some petrochemicals that caused some uh some issues with uh, things that are produced using petrochemicals. And, and so I, I'm not sure that the lean model goes away, um, but certainly we've got to get smart about ways to countermeasure these types of uh, supply issues. But when, when they're global and when they're broad scale, you know, it's really difficult to, to have kind of your own unique solution to them. Yeah. You know, Paul, th- you, you talked about software and you talked about effectively this extraordinary digitization of mobility, right? That we're, you know, th- that that is a big part of the story here. That would suggest to me um, uh, and maybe even casual observers that that frankly demand for the microprocessors that really drive compute- the computing power and the integration that you're talking about you know, we're going to have increasing needs, it seems to me, for this type of these types of microchips, auto grade microchips in the future. Uh, Is is that your sense? And do we, um, as a matter of policy here in the United States, make sure that we have some control over our own destiny uh, a little bit with regard to microprocessors? What's your take there? Yeah, I mean, uh... To, to answer your first question, yes. I mean, everything's be everything is connected nowadays, right? You you all your coffee machines are connected. Things that weren't connected before are. So yes, there's going to be a higher demand in the consumer market for connected devices, which is great for us. Um, you know, Bosch has a lot of different types of products um, that we have that we want to be connected, right? So yeah, I don't see there being a slowdown in the desire and need for smart devices. Um, you know. Looking at it from a standpoint of North American production, do we need to protect ourselves or, or things? You know, I, I think you know, I'm, on, I'm on the side where Tom is. You know, we we had a lot of things happen in the industry. Um, the automotive industry can learn a little bit from the consumer industry on the way they purchase semiconductors and the way they go through their demand and supply models. I think our manufacturing um, programs are still very robust, whether you call it lean manufacturing or Bosch production system whatever we want to call it. I think when um, things are correct, they work perfectly. But when you have a global pandemic along with increased demand for laptops, iPads, iCameras, cameras, you name it, um, it creates a dilemma. Um, I would like to see um, a shortened um, supply chain, whether that means it happens domestically or internationally, that allows for more flexibility and transparency in the industry. And I think that that is something that I, I know we're all working on um, in total. Um, do I say we put all the manufacturing in North America for North America? And no, I wouldn't go as far as saying that. I think the transparency is important and the investment has to be made smartly, right? I mean, you're talking of billions of dollars in investment 
to create our own little market for semiconductors. I don't think that's the, the, the most intelligent thing to do. So I think we just have to get the transparency in place, make sure the supply chains are um, robust and create a little bit of a hedge um, along the way. Yeah. Because you never very, know how much enough is enough, right? I mean, right. I back to Tom's message. So. Right. Very, very helpful. Um, you know, we we we're we're getting toward the end of our our time here, so I want to just finish up by asking you to really look into your crystal balls. And, and you're both seasoned senior automotive executives. You've been in the business a long time, but you're also engaged at the cutting edge of the industry. So. Where is the future of personal mobility going, you know, in 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 your views and 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 how does it affect, you know, the product development and production process? And 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 uh, Tom, let me start with you. Uh, sure, John. So the clear trends point towards greater electrification, greater levels of autonomy and driver support much greater connectivity and data services and things like that. And frankly, more competition because of these new parts of the uh, ecosystem that are that are coming into our space. Uh, more competition and new and different competitors than we've ever had before. Um, what's What's less clear is, to me, you know, we're still going to have vehicles with four wheels, I believe, right? And so what's less clear is what's going to power them and in what time frame. I think the, and and how autonomous will they ultimately get, right? Um, th there's another set of really key questions that are fascinating, and you could do a whole nother session on them, which is, are people going to buy and drive their cars in the future. Right. Or our mobility provider is going to buy and drive the cars for you. Or will those cars drive themselves? Or will the governments uh, even allow vehicles in certain places in the future? You know, we're seeing uh, city, uh, uh, you know, policies to prohibit uh, certain vehicles or vehicles, you know, at, on a global scale. Um, for environmental reasons, largely, but so so there's a lot of uncertainty in what the future customer looks like, uh, who is that future customer, and so forth. But the good news, as I said, is most personal transportation, I think, is still going to have four wheels and a cabin, and so we're still going to need manufacturing. And um, like I said, it's it's a it's a great place to be, I think, in the future. Tom, thank you. Paul, last word goes to you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I'd like to focus on a couple different things. And um, uh, is first of all, I think the scenario planning that we've seen in the past will become much more rapid. In the past, consumers would accept that you changed your vehicle model every five or six years and you waited for the new model to come out. I don't think consumers are gonna be willing to wait for the next software, the next improved driver's assistance package or safety package. So I think the scenario planning in the industry will speed up. Um, get closer to what we see in consumer electronics that you're getting updates for your from your Android system or your Apple system every couple of weeks to improve the performance. So I think consumers will require a faster rate of change, which of course makes the automotive industry a much different one than we've seen in the past. I also agree with Tom that the mobility market will become larger than just what we see about the ownership of a vehicle for personal usage. We're starting to measure it less in um, the number of vehicles sold, but maybe in the number of miles driven. Because last mile delivery um, services like Uber and Uber Eats and DoorDash are creating much more mileage being driven as people bring more products to their house individually versus going out in groups to restaurants. So I think you know, these additional services and uh, convenience solutions will be important and no longer do people want to wait three days for their Amazon delivery. They want it, if they order it at 4 p.m., they want it 10 p.m., right? So we're going to start seeing the speed of mobility and the way that mobility communicates with the consumer also increasing. And then I think that everything I just mentioned is creating an increased um, interest in the industry. If we look at some of the movements in the of some of our top executives from our customers and from our suppliers of where they're moving in the industry. You used to see uh, a top executive go from an OEM to another OEM 
or or things like now you're starting to see them move into different industries and people coming from other industries into the automotive into the automotive world. So I think those are the changes I'm keeping my eyes on for the future of mobility. Of course, the vehicle is important, um, the software is important, but how do we measure success related to satisfying the consumer in a way that um, either increases their mobility experience or increases the way they can um, have frictionless uh, delivery of products or services. So that's kind of where I'm going with it, John. Of course, build lots of cars, let's deliver lots of hardware, but let's also deliver solutions to the, uh, to the market that people want. Fantastic. Tom, Paul, thanks for such a great uh, and forward-looking conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, John. I wanna thank our panelists and all of you for being part of what has been a fascinating and important discussion. Like Congress, we will be taking a break in August. So look for our next forum in September. Until then, we'll make sure to keep you posted about our efforts to chart the path to a cleaner, safer, smarter, personal transportation future. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>